So welcome everyone. We are very happy to uh, launch this uh, other version of our lunch and learn seminars online. Uh, I am Anne Claire Pache. I'm the chair professor of SX chair in, in philanthropy. And we are very fortunate to have great uh, guests today. Arthur will uh, uh, soon tell you more about it. One word about this lunch and learn seminars. The idea is really to combine research and practice and to engage in fruitful conversations between scholars and uh, people who actually do real work on the, on the field. And uh, this is uh, really a great conversation that we're going to have uh, today. Um, Arthur, I, I hand it over to, to you. Yes, thank you, Anne Claire. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Arthur Gauthier. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, the team, I'm uh, the executive director of the ESSEC Philanthropy Chair, and I'm also um, an assistant professor at ESSEC. Uh, the full team of the chair is here today, actually, so uh, you will also uh, uh, get to know uh, my colleagues uh, Anne Monnier and uh, Gaëtan Lefebvre and Sarah Cassin, who all contribute to this uh, seminar today. Uh, just a few um, rules before we start. Um, and Claire just mentioned it. Uh, it's possible to rename yourself if you um, if you do a right click on your camera uh, screen. You can you know change your, your 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 name. We advise you if you if you agree to to put your full name and maybe your your organization that that you work for. That would be that would be nice uh, as well, so that we know who is who in the in the chat room. Um, the default settings for this uh, webinar is that uh, the mics are off, uh, but you will have the opportunity to, to ask questions, of course, uh, to, our, to our presenters. Um, there are two ways uh, in which you can um, ask questions during the seminar. You can write them in the chat uh, whenever you want. It can be during the, the, the presentations themselves or after them. We will have a look at them. Uh, but in, uh, in between presentations, uh, I, I will also moderate uh, a discussion. So if you want to speak up uh, after Cathy, Kathleen's and, and Florence's presentation, you can do so by raising your hand. So you can use this tool uh, on Zoom. It's easy to find. You can go on participants. Uh, and then you have the opportunity to, to raise your hand with the little blue uh, icon here uh, shown on your screen. The webinar will be recorded, so it's going to be available on replay. And you can also use uh, the live tweet uh, that is written on your screen if you want to uh, engage um, your community uh, and, and comment about uh, the webinar. So I think I, I made most of the uh, you know, housekeeping rules uh, clear. Um, so um, let's start our, our, our webinar. Um, so the, the theme of today uh, is uh, Philanthropy, a Path to Empowerment for Women. Um, we have two great guest speakers. I will let my colleague Anne Moni present them uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, before uh, we get started, I would like uh, to uh, launch a, a very quick poll uh, so that every, uh, everybody in the room will actually be able to, uh, to participate. Um, so the first poll that we would like to, to, uh, to launch uh, is the following, it should appear on your screen. To you, what is women's philanthropy? Um, so this is a very uh, fairly basic question, but uh, as you understand, the, the, the concept is a bit uh, polysemous. So we would like to know what it means to you when you saw this invitation for a seminar about women and philanthropy, what do you think uh, it is? So. We will take just a few more seconds to um, to vote. So click on the choice or the choices because I think you can select more than one answer. So to you, what is women's philanthropy? I see that about all, almost all of you have voted now. We can wait maybe a few more seconds. Okay, great. So um, thank you for voting. Um, I think we can share the, the results to you now. Uh, so to you, what is uh, women's philanthropy? A majority of you um, said that it's uh, women philanthropists. So philanthropists 
uh, that happen to be women. Uh, it's the most, uh, you know, given uh, answer in the in the survey. 71% uh, of you chose this uh, this answer uh, among the others, uh, and, and it's true. We will see in in both um, Kathleen's and Florencia presentation that we will put forward the, the profiles and the, and the, the, the objectives and the goals of women philanthropists uh, actually. So uh, I think we are aligned. Your vision, your vision is aligned with uh, the topic of, uh, of both of speakers, uh, but we, we will also see that uh, uh, philanthropy for women uh, is also part of the, of the presentations that we will have today. You know, the, the cause of uh, you know, investing uh, in the cause of women uh, is also something that uh, Kathleen and, and Florencia will uh, will uh, touch upon in their presentations. Okay, um, thank you for for um, participating to this to this poll. Uh, I think now it's time to to uh, meet our two guest speakers, and I would like to thank them a lot because it's very early in the morning for them. <laughs> so we have uh, uh, you know one in New York City and the other one in Uruguay. Uh, so thanks a lot to both of you for being there. And uh, now I will let my, um, my colleague uh, Anne Monnier uh, uh, present very quickly our two guest speakers and uh, you know, what they will talk about today. Anne? Thank you. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm Anne Monnier, and I'm a research fellow at ESSEC Philanthropy Chair. So I'm very happy to present this topic of women's philanthropy today, all the more as it is not often addressed. In fact, a few studies and research have tackled this crucial topic. So of course, we all know Françoise betancourt meyers Laureen Powell Jobs, Mackenzie Scott, and there are many women philanthropists, but they are often not as well known as their male counterparts. So yet, as historical scholarship has shown, the role of women in philanthropy has always been key and has given them the opportunity to play a role in the public sphere at a time when they were usually confined to the private sphere and excluded from political arenas. So today we're going to ask some questions. So what are the specificities of women's philanthropy, but also who are the women philanthropists and is philanthropy a path to empowerment for women? So the political science perspective is quite relevant to think about philanthropy through the lens of gender, as it tackles the question of the role of women in society. So is philanthropy a means for women to change society, to challenge established norms and even their own status? So that's a big question. <laughs> and to explore this fascinating topic, we have the pleasure to welcome two great speakers. So Kathleen McCarthy and Florencia uh, Rothstein. So to introduce them, uh, Kathleen McCarthy is professor of history and founding director of the Center of Philanthropy and Civil Society at the Graduate Center and of the University, University of New York. And her books, edited volumes and articles explore philanthropy and civil society in local, national and international contexts and she has lectured on these topics worldwide. She is currently working on a book on women, power, and money from the first Gilded Age to the second. Florencia Rothstein is professor at the University of San Andres in Argentina. She has been committed to sustainable development and philanthropy for the last 25 years in various roles and in various institutions around the world. She is the co-founder and director of the program AES, Women and Philanthropy at the Center for the Study of State and Society in Argentina. And she is the co-author of the book, La Rebelión de lo Cotidiano, Mujeres Generosas que Cambian América Latina, which was published in 2020. So before I give the floor to Kathleen, we have a second poll for you with some numbers. Um, so we really struggled to find numbers on women's philanthropists, which shows again the fact that it's not studied enough. So now, quick quiz based on a study conducted by the Observatoire de la Fondation de France on funds and foundations and published in 2014. The question is, among individuals who created a fund or a foundation in France between 2001 and 2014, what is the percentage of women? 
11%, 37%, 52%, or 68%. I give you some minutes to answer and submit. And we will soon see the results, I hope. <laughs> Thirty-seven. Wow, you're also clever. The ans answer is in fact thirty-seven percent, while fifty-two were men and eleven were couples. Uh, so there is a huge paradox here. We can see that there are less women creating funds or foundation than men, while it is known they tend to be more generous. So women's philanthropy is often more discreet, less visible. Uh, however, they have a key role. And as historical contemporary studies have shown, and as we will see also today. So to do so, and I am now going to give the floor to Kathleen McCarthy. Kathleen, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Uh, let me begin by saying how delighted I am to be here, even at this very early hour in New York. All of the sun finally came up, so this is great. Um, thanks, too, for the organizers, all of you, for inviting me. This is a, both an honor and a pleasure. Um, it's also a pleasure to be on the program with Florencia, who was one of the, our international fellows at the center that I direct. So um, it's this, I, Florencia, I think this is the first time we've been on a program together, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, second slide, um, Ar Arthur, thanks. Um, Women's philanthropy has a long history beginning in the 1790s in the United States and even earlier in France. In fact, in some ways, France was far ahead of the United States in the early 19th century. Uh, for example, the women who ran France's maternal societies that worked to help poor children and poor women keep their infants um, coupled national subsidies with their work as volunteers and their work in fundraising. And this gave them a direct role in shaping some of the country's key pronatalist policies. It took American women another century to develop this kind of partnership with our national government. Most of their alliances were with local governments. And also you tend to think of England as the country that really spread voluntary associations uh, around Europe and the rest of the world in this period, but Napoleon was very active in spreading maternal societies throughout the empire in Italy and Germany and in just all sorts of places. So um, uh, it's, it's quite extraordinary. Um, and so this, um, the, the dichotomies, there's a, hit, there's a hidden history here. And Florencia, I think, will be talking about some of the hidden histories that we're just starting to explore in Latin America. But although scholars have looked at internal societies, they really haven't looked at them in terms of philanthropy per se, um, and particularly in comparative uh, 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 analyses. During the 19th century, in both countries, women's philanthropy was based on an economy of time, volunteer time rather than money. Women raised the funds and built and ran the organizations, especially for women and children, um, like the maternal society or orphanages in the US. Um, and in my country, they also played a very important role in the anti-slavery and temperance and later the suffrage movements for social reform. For some reason, French women were not as involved in these activities. They were far less likely to participate in social reform groups. But in my country, through these kind of volunteer activities, um, they changed the constitution three times before they had the vote. So the country's fundamental political document. And this is real power. Besides opening the door to national policymaking and political change, <laughs> um, volunteerism had a financial value, hence my use of the term an economy of time. For example, the independent sector has placed a dollar value on time, volunteer time in the US today using a low hourly 
rate of roughly twice the minimum wage. Um, what they've done is they've done widespread surveys to see how many hours people are volunteering and then they, um, they multiply that by this very low figure. And for example, if an executive is serving on a board, she's, her time is worth far more than 24 to $25 an hour. Independent sector is a coalition of um, donor organizations and nonprofits in the United States and it's a very important institution. Even at this low figure, uh, volunteer time is worth, estimated to be worth billions of dollars, accounting for almost half of all the funds that are giving, uh, given in the United States. So it's really important. And the idea is that this, this value is what it would cost to replace the workers in, um, and it, to replace the number of workers that women are um, accounting for in nonprofit organizations. And even with the maternal societies, one of the reasons they got government society, governmental uh, subsidies in France was because they were lowering the cost of caring for, of childcare and caring for inf infants and keeping babies alive. America's first Gilded Age from the 1870s to about the 1910s produced my country's first crop of multimillionaires, including mega donors like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller. It also redefined philanthropy in terms of large monetary gifts. Andrew Carnegie's gospel of wealth was the clearest statement of that shift. Carnegie argued that the rich were stewards of their wealth and they had an obligation to spend it on building institutions for their communities. Everything from universities and of course libraries, which was one of his favorites, to research institutes. He also had an unfortunate dislike of the poor and suggested that it uh, was better to throw money into the sea than waste it on paupers, which was a far cry from the, the, the more generous spirit, spirit that you saw in women's char charities. Donors like Rockefeller and Carnegie pioneered in the development of the modern corporation, and they used corporate models to create centralized institutions, things like foundations and universities, major museums and medical and social science research institutes. These institutions, unlike women's organizations, were hierarchical, bureaucratic, and run almost entirely by male experts. Um, even the wealthiest women in this period had gave far less because they were hemmed in by trusts and naysaying trustees. Uh, that, and that was even after Married Women's Property Acts allowed women to control uh, their own estates. Under English common law, un until these property acts began to be passed in the middle of the 19th century, once a woman married, she handed off her estate, her clothing, all of her possessions to her husband who could use them any way he wanted, he could gamble them away, he could lose them through bad investments. So women were financially uh, vulnerable and they weren't able to amass the kind of cash that would allow them to become monetary philanthropists. And afterwards, the wealthiest families, particularly in places like New York, developed trusts, which gave women access to the income of their estates but didn't let them touch the capital. So they had far, far less money than the men in these wealthy families. And therefore, once again, it was much harder for them to become a donor on the scale of Rockefeller and Carnegie. This began to change after the turn of the century when a few daughters and widows started to inherit larger fortunes. None developed foundations or research institutes on a par with men like Rockefeller and Carnegie, but they did significantly shape a number of subfields. For example, Olivia Sage probably inherited the largest fortune in this period. She was a childless widower who had been married to a financier. Um, and when he died in 1906, he left her a $75 million fortune. Uh, her comment was, I'm 77 years old and I've just begun to live. 
she created um, the Russell Sage Foundation, erasing her name, even though he hated her charitable work, uh, which was an operating foundation rather than giving grants. And it played a very important role, not only in social science research, but in the professionalization of social work. So a subfield. Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, who you can see over there, was one of three women who founded the Museum of Modern Art. And women um, played a very important role in my country in fostering the, um, the development of modern art, helping to make the United States an international arts center. They also pioneered a lot of other fields like folk art, American art, bringing Impressionism to the United States and developing house museums. And they did it with far less than men like Rockefeller and Carnegie. Um, when, go back a little bit. Um, the, when Abby started the Museum of Modern Art in 1929, it had an annual budget of $100,000 compared to the millions that her husband, who hated modern art, put into the development of the Cloisters, which is a medieval museum, a, a museum of medieval art. And if you think of the comparative sums, Olivia Sage put $10 million into the Russell Sage Foundation John D. Rockefeller started the Rockefeller Foundation with an initial pledge of $100 million. So the scale is completely different. And this reflects the fact that even women like Sage had far less money at their command to, do, to become philanthropists. And most women, even the richest, inherited fortunes around a million dollars. But a lot of that was in jewels. And many of those turned out to be fake when they were praised. So um, an entirely different fin uh, financial situation, even when it looked like they were rich from the outside. Um, okay, next slide. America's second gil Gilded Age began in the 1980s and continues to the present, uh, giving rise to the first country's first crop of billionaires. And there you see two of them, Steve Jobs, who founded Apple, and his widow, Laureen, um, who has uh, begun to engage in philanthropy in a large scale through the Emerson Collective. The women in this group often have a very different relationship to money than their mothers, their mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers who, from the first Gilded Age. In fact, many of them have worked in the paid workforce. Melinda Gates was an executive at Microsoft and a very early executive at Microsoft, which means that she's, uh, she's at least a multimillionaire, if not a billionaire in her own right, because of the stock that she would have gotten in that role. And they also inherit from their parents and their husband's estate. Because women still tend to outlive their husbands, um, sorry, gentlemen, uh, many of today's largest fortunes will eventually pass to their control. And they've also gotten much smarter about things like prenuptial agreements. So they're in a much better financial position. Next slide. Helping women to manage the, their money and their philanthropy is becoming big business in my country. In addition to investment firms, there is a growing universe of donor self-help communities, some of which are listed here. Um, and in a way, this is actually a blessing because some of the first billion dollar gifts to be given by women um, in the early 2000s really weren't well thought out. Uh, Joan Kroc, the widow of Ray Kroc, who founded McDonald's, gave $1.5 billion to the Salvation Army without consulting them about how the money should be used. And as a result, um, the community centers that she wanted were very difficult for them to develop and it took them a long time to be able to absorb the money. <clears throat> but the most spectacular example of an unfortunate gift was Leona Helmsley bequest, be Helmsley's bequest in 2007. Um, Helms Wheatley wasn't terribly well liked. She was known as the queen of mean by the people in her hotels, uh, but she did have one friend named Trouble. And in 2007, she left a $4 billion bequest 
to create a trust for, wait for it, dogs. Um, or canine welfare, if you like. I, you know, I, I love dogs, but for $4 billion, you could do a lot with genomic research to cure cancer or other things. The will was finally broken, um, and now the Helmsley Trust does health and uh, global development. But it was quite extraordinary at the time, and even Trouble, her dog, who apparently was the only creature who actually liked her, uh, walked away with a $12, billion, uh, $12 million trust. So a very wealthy puppy. Um, since then, women have gotten a lot savvier about the kinds of things that they are given, giving to, in part because of the development of these self-help communities that allow them to work together to study various kinds of alternatives before they decide where to go. The richest is the Giving Pledge, which was co-founded <clears throat> by Melinda and Bill Gates, as well as Warren Buffett in 2010. Normally it's described as simply being founded by um, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, but she was a full partner in its creation. Most <clears throat> of the members are billionaires who agree to donate at least half of their fortunes um, and over a hundred signatories are wives um, or single women, a few of whom made fortunes on their own. <clears throat> um, for example, Mackenzie Scott, who just uh, divorced, just got a $35 billion settlement in her divorce for Jeff Bezos, is a member. Um, Cheryl Sandberg, who wrote Lean In, is a member. She's a, an executive at Facebook. And Sarah Blakely, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Sarah Blakely. She, um, she's a young female entrepreneur who created an instrument of torture known as Spanx. It's sort of like a rubber band, a large rubber band that women can put on to um, improve their figures. But um, she's made billions with it. And um, while some of the older members in the Giving Pledge often give to institutions named for their husbands, many of the younger donors are trying to tackle more amorphous challenges such as reducing poverty or curing cancer. Um, Mackenzie Scott has already given $1.7 billion for climate change, racial issues, um, LGBT issues, and um, health. Sandberg has moved uh, toward trying to spread her idea of women's groups leaning in and mentoring each other. And she's also uh, promoting other ways for to advance women in business and working to um, uh, combat sexual stereotypes. And Blakely is very um, in, involved in trying to help female entrepreneurs. Next slide, please. Next slide, thanks. The central question in the book that I'm working on, on the history of women, power, and money in the United States is, what difference will it make? Will women do anything differently than earlier male megadonors like John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie? And Gates's autobiography, called Manifesto, Moment of Lift, may provide an answer. While Rockefeller and Carnegie built centralized hierarchical institutions, Gates wants to reshape the world around women's priorities, values, and needs. Um, and while Carnegie's gospel of wealth focused on institutions, Gates's is decentralized, paralleling the effects of the uh, communications revolution that she and her husband helped to set in motion. Um, it's, it's quite extraordinary. It's become much more amorphous. And many women donors are starting to focus on changing values rather than building institutions, as well as providing opportunities for other women. As Gates explains, educated girls make better mothers, helping to reduce infant mortality. They can also increase family earnings, reducing poverty. They tend to marry later, reducing the chance of dying from uh, having children too young, which is a major source of teen mortality among girls in developing nations. 
Older educated wives may also be less susceptible to the kind of domestic violence that illiterate child brides suffer because the power differentials are smaller. Since women and girls do much of the world's farming, female focused agricultural programs can help increase crop yields and reduce hunger. Flexible working hours and better childcare can increase corporate productivity by better reflecting the needs of their workforces and women's caregiving responsibilities. Educating more women in, to work in tech industries, especially women of color, can help to reduce the kinds of racial and gender biases that are currently being built into AI programs, artificial intelligence programs. Support for female entrepreneurs can broaden the range and products and, uh, and businesses uh, that serve various populations, strengthening the economy. More women in political office means that they won't be excluded from drafting the laws that shape their own and their families' lives. Um, in my country, my country ranks 97th in terms of the representation in women in high political office out of 142 countries. So we're pretty low on the list. Earlier this year, Gates made a $1 billion pledge to back her vision with action. And that's just getting off the ground. One of her campaigns is the Equality Can't Wait Challenge. Um, and she just put $40 million into that with some help from Mackenzie Scott. Um, to look at how to advance women politically, economically, in the tech sector, and, um, and in terms of their caregiving responsibilities. Her book is actually pretty radical. She also wants to um, rearrange the uh, responsibilities for caregiving in families. She really wants to break down the hierarchies and make families and marriages more equitable. And she argues that all of this is in men's interest. In the case of um, splitting caregiving responsibilities, she suggests that the, um, the prize will be better sex. So we'll see how she does, but it's a very ambitious agenda. Next slide, please. So the question is, will anyone listen? Gates is one of the richest people in the world. Yet most of her book deals with voice and women's difficulties in being heard, no matter how rich they are. And she talks about the difficulties in representing the, fat, the, 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 the foundation and feeling invisible next to her husband, who has, she says, has a very strong voice. She also talked about how hard it was to get people in the Gates Foundation interested in women's issues and women's equality, even though when you have a program like ag agriculture and women are doing most of the planting in many developing countries, if you don't help them get the right seeds, your crop yields are going to go down because they'll stop using the seeds that you're trying to give them. So even though it was in the interest of various program officers, she had a very hard time being heard. And the press coverage on her billion dollar pledge seems to bear this out. It was surprisingly thin compared to some of the reporting on the gifts by Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg and Warren Buffett who helped co-found the giving pledge with her. Carnegie felt that far too few had heeded his gospel of wealth, but giving was highly individualistic in the 19th century and highly atomized. Unlike Carnegie, Gates has a ready-made community of very wealthy donors in the Giving Pledge, which once again, she helped to found. How many will follow her lead? So far, that photo says it all. Um, she's still at the margins for most of these donors. So um, I look forward to your comments and questions. And once again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Uh, uh, great presentation. A lot of uh, things packed in 20 minutes. 20 minutes. So thanks a lot. And um, and uh, now I think it's time to um, maybe open the floor for a, a few round of questions based on Kathleen's presentations. Um, so um, what uh, I offer you to to to, to do now is to uh, raise your hand if you want to uh, uh, ask a question about Kathleen's presentation. There will be more opportunities 
later on after Florencia's presentation as well, because we will engage in a discussion based on the two presentations. But now is the, is the first um, opportunity to do so. Uh, and uh, I also invite my colleagues, uh, Anne-Claire and Anne, to uh, uh, raise, you know, take the lead if they also want to ask a questions to, uh, to, to Kathleen. Anne-Claire, you wanted to, and yes. so Carole, uh, so Anne-Claire maybe go first and then uh, Carole, I will give you the floor. I have a question, so I, I, I'm going to be uh, quick. We've heard a lot of um, discussion in the past you know, months or, or years regarding um, you know, the, the, the problem, potentially problematic role of uh, philanthropy um, in um, somehow um, you know, illegitimately shaping democratic agendas. Um, and uh, I'm wondering, you know, given the figures that you mentioned, especially in the U.S. context, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, the the low representation of women in uh, power, I'm wondering whether you would see, you know, women philanthropists as opportunity somehow to avoid th this, you know, democratic challenges that, uh, you know, male philanthropists may. Um, contribute to in somehow influencing their friends who are in power to change the policy that they would like to see changed. Uh, whereas that may be, you know, less the, the, the route thought by women. Does, could that make sense? Do you see this as somehow a, a way in which women philanthropy may differ from male philanthropy? Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, there are two kinds of power that you're talking about. One is trying to change the laws. And that's a very, very old role of philanthropy. If you go back to social reform, uh, the anti-slavers were trying to eradicate slavery. The temperance advocates were trying to outlaw drinking. Um, the suffragists were trying to change the constitution so women could vote. And that, that's, a, that's an important part of what philanthropy does. The other part is meddling with a political situation. And that's something quite different and something quite scary. And there's a lot of that going on in my country as well, especially with something called dark money that's been given by people like the Koch brothers to um, mobilize political action and shape elections. And uh, I only know of one large donor who's involved in that on the far right, who's a woman. Um, so I don't think women have engaged in that to the same extent. But you know, if you're talking about trying to eradicate child marriage, you're talking about trying to change both values and laws and making sure that the laws are enforced. So for me, there is a clear line between working through advocacy groups in the nonprofit sector to provide information that will encourage le le legislators to change laws and people who are directly using their money to meddle with the political system. Also, you know, the, the scale is scary. Um, the, Olivier Zunz's book on American philanthropy talked about how uh, when Gavi, the um, vaccine organization, was being form funded and formed, um, the backers included four or five countries and Bill Gates. So a single individual is being put on a par with nation states. Um, and that too should raise concerns. Um, with what I've seen so far in the philanthropy that's bubbling up at the highest levels um, by being given by women, it hasn't moved anywhere near that kind of insidious direction except for one woman. But it's an important question. And, you know, where are the boundaries between appropriate and inappropriate behavior is a, is a really serious question when you're talking about wealth on this scale. Thank you, Kathleen. And now uh, I think Carola is uh, up for a question. Carola? 
Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kathy, for uh, for this wonderful presentation. Listening to you, I couldn't stop thinking about uh, mainstream foundations. Uh, so not uh, women philanthropists, but mainstream foundation and how much we are still in this kind of false dichotomy or trade off between doing good and doing business. And uh, uh, why we do know now uh, we have literature, we have evidence that actually investing in women is doing good business. Um, in the last couple of years in Europe, we had uh, like uh, Equileap or other uh, benchmark uh, and assessment of uh, um, uh, that that really shows this to investors and to, to social investors and to philanthropy. But still, uh, uh, <laughs> we don't have uh, uh, women in the board or in leadership position or in the governance. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and so in the end, uh, uh, it, it could take other, another generation here, according to the um, European Gender Equality Report, to really have a significant uh, representation of women that could lead this change. Um, so what can we do in order to engage all also mainstream funders and foundations? So not only um, women philanthropists. That's a really good question. Um, and I, I should say that Carola is another one of our uh, uh, international fellows and it's wonderful to see you. Um, there's a lot of essentialist talk about what women fund. They're more caring, they're more giving, they're more likely to fund uh, children and health and education. Well, no, men fund those things as well. The one area where women have really found a niche and where they comprise the majority of the donors is in funding for women and women's advancement. Um, how do you get men involved? It's, it's a slow process and Gates talks about getting Bill on board with her vision, which has also been a slow process, even though she presents it as a, a very stable um, marriage. But she's very smart in, in Moment of Lift and she finds arguments for why this is in men's interest to do from increased prosperity to happier, a happier home life, to um, she argues that men who do more caregiving um, are tend to be less depressed and so on. And I presume she's got the scholarly backing for this because she's, as she said, she always over prepares and has to know the facts. Um, the other way that feminists started to get men involved in thinking about women's uh, causes and also the role of women in business was through Take Our Daughters to Work Day, which was started by the Ms. Foundation several decades ago. And that you know, really made men see their daughters in their offices when they accompanied them and think about their future. And the argument there is that when men understand that this also has meaning for their own daughters, that they are more likely to listen and come on board. But once again, it, it has less to do with changing institutions at this point than changing values, uh, a fact of which Gates is keenly aware. And that's why she's focusing on changing values and finding a way to get men to understand that this is in their self-interest as well. Thank you. Thank so you, Kathleen. Thank you, Carola, for your your question. Uh, maybe we have time for a final question based on uh, Kathleen's presentation alone, uh, and then we can uh, move on to uh, our second part. Yes, I see Valérie raising your hand. Valérie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for the presentation. I was wondering, what about the new generations? Can you, I don't know if we can predict, but can you see a trend in the way women, young women, that are also entrepreneurs, um, change in, in uh, philanthropy behavior compared well, to the, the previous generations? 
Yeah, you can see generational changes in the giving pledge. Uh, the oldest members tend to fund uh, you know, buildings at universities that, ha that carry their husband's names. Uh, very institutional kind of solution and, and focused on what the men were interested in. The younger women are, are very interesting. There's, there's one named in the Giving Pledge named Carrie Tuna and she's in her 30s and is married to one of the founders of Facebook. And um, she was an investigative reporter for the Wall Street Journal before she got married. And she turned those skills to studying philanthropy and they put all the reports up as they went along and now they're looking at issues of poverty. But because the younger women tend to be very well educated, um, the definition of a trophy wife has dramatically changed from the 19th century when no education or polite education in languages and music was the ideal to today when some of these women have a degree from Harvard and a, an advanced degree from Cambridge and so on and so forth. So um, they're far better educated. They are far more equipped to do research, um, to find the best experts, to find the best answers, to find out where the niches are that they can fill with their, their funding. And um, they're also professionally trained. Some of them are doctors. And um, Priscilla Chan, for example, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg's wife is a pediatrician. So they're also bringing that kind of expertise to the, the work that they're developing through their gifts. So um, the, that's the most striking generational change. And also as you go through generations, you see women taking on a much more equitable role and where the men are still employed, usually it's the women who are running the philanthropy, although clearly in consultation with their husbands if they're couples. Thanks a lot, Kathleen. It's, uh, it's great. So we had the time for three uh, uh, you know, insightful questions. So thanks to all of you. Uh, I propose now to, to move things forward. Thanks again, Kathleen, and we will hear you in a couple of minutes for the, the, the debate with Florencia. Uh, just before giving the floor to Florencia, we have a final um, exercise to, uh, to propose to all of you. Um, I will let my uh, colleague Anne uh, comment on the, on the results. Uh, I think we have, I will, uh, I will show you, we will create together a, a world cloud. Is, is that correct, uh, Anne? So I'm gonna prepare yes. that. Yes, uh, so we're going to launch a world cloud. Um, Arthur is going to put a slide with all the information about it. So the question is, name one woman philanthropist with the first name and then the last name. And you just have to go to www.menti.com, as you can see on the screen, and use the code, uh, so 541561. Um, and so you answer with first name and then last name. And we will give you uh, maybe a minute to do so. Uh, I don't know if we can put the, the, the link on the chat, that would be, that would be great. Uh, so the idea is just to connect to uh, menti.com and use the access code 541501. And then you can answer and we will see all your proposals pop up on the screen. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> and it can be, uh, and you agree, it can be uh, so somebody that you really uh, you know, yes. think of when, when we say women philanthropists, somebody that you want to you know, that, that you admire uh, for a specific reason. And yeah, so let's hear your, your propositions. Great. So many names and also not only Americans, but also French, uh, Spanish, uh, So it's great to see how many names you have. Let's wait a few more, maybe one more minute so that everybody can, can put their name. It's uh, the count is at 17 people now, don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, Beyonce also, interesting name. So now the biggest name is Melinda Gates. It's not Mackenzie Bezos anymore, which is, uh, she's called Mackenzie Scott now that she's divorced. Christine Lagarde also, interesting. So maybe 20 more seconds and then uh, Anne, you can wrap it up and I will. Uh... Uh, Michelle Obama, interesting. Mm -hmm. Oprah Winfrey also is a big one. So what is interesting is the international aspect of this <laughs> word cloud. I really thought we were only going to have Americans and French, but now we have many others and some unexpected. Um, so as you see on this word cloud, uh, there are mostly the most famous philanthropists, um, but beyond this very well-known philanthropist, there are also so many other women, very diverse and different, who commit daily to their community, often in silence and without media coverage. And we're going to talk about all these other women with Florencia. So maybe I will... Um, let Florencia um, speak now. Florencia, thank, uh, thank you so much for being with us and the floor is yours. You can share your screen. So Florencia, we can see your slides. Uh, we cannot hear you yet, but uh, the slides are great. It's, uh, they are but beautiful. now you can hear me, right? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Great. So sorry about that. I was saying that uh, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And also, I'm very glad that, um, as you mentioned before, you are uh, speaking about uh, women and philanthropy. Um, the first thing I want to say that after listening to Katy, presentation that are absolutely great and interesting. Uh, I'm going to say that I'm going to share with you a completely different uh, story of what is happening in Latin America. Uh, we don't have Melinda's, uh, we don't have McKinsey's, we don't have all those kind of women from the elites who are more and more educated and who are trying to improve the situation of women. Um, so uh, we have a completely different set of women who are actually uh, doing philanthropy. Uh, and I hope that uh, I will be able to share with you that. I'm gonna move quickly. Uh, so to give a lot of space, <clears throat> sorry about that, uh, for exchange. So this is who we are. Um, Uh, sorry, what happened? Left. Here, yeah. Um, so this is our, uh, uh, well, uh, I am the founder and director of an organization that is called EJAS, uh, Women and Philanthropy. This is the website for those of you who wanna check it out. Uh, this organization I uh, co-founded with Andres Thompson and uh, the mission of uh, the organization is actually to propel a philanthropic movement of women of all ages and economic status in Latin Florencia, I think you're breaking. Your connection is not, maybe not very good. So maybe in the meantime, um, we can um, draw some links between uh, what Kathleen was saying and also what Florencia is going to present which is that um, many of the philanthropists we know are like big elites, very important women with a lot of money. And we often forget that there are other women very invested and mostly who give time and not money. I, I think this is something that Kathleen was saying and that was very interesting. Men give money and women give time. And now it seems like 
women are giving more money, but also there are a lot of women giving time um, that are not very well known. So that was what Kathleen was um, talking about, the economy of time. And we all know that time is money. So we women give a lot. Um, and this is really something that um, some research on, for example, the nonprofit sector in France have shown how uh, women give a lot of their time and do a lot of free work and involve a lot of the caring work in society, while men are more about image and um, more about creating buildings with their names, as Kathleen was saying. Um, so this is something very interesting and Florencia's work really uh, shows how they're like shadow women, uh, women who are in the shadow, who are less viewed, um, really invisible and who do a lot of work. Um, and I think it's very important to, to know a lot more about these women um, who are like uh, daily heroes of their community. Um, so maybe another interesting thing about women's philanthropy is that um, sometimes we see, when we see all the donors of institutions, that there are many couples. So the distinction between women's philanthropy and couples' philanthropy, we can see that sometimes um, the names, both names are on the paper, on the brochure, but a lot of time the woman gives a lot of time and uh, investment into organizing the events, the galas, while the man just comes to the gala and doesn't prepare anything and just give money, um, which is something very interesting. But I think also this idea of um, maybe differ differentiating between uh, couples and single or divorced women is interesting. Uh, as we can see, many of the married women give uh, to institutions um, that are supported by their husbands. We can see, for example, that Melinda Gates has really a lot of trouble um, oh, Florencia is coming, <laughs> so I will let her uh, speak. Great. I have to wait. I will. I need to wait for to the whole thing for coming back. Sorry about that, but well, this is part of living and working in Latin America. <laughs> the connection is always uh, down. But let me. Sorry about that. Let me continue. Um, oh my God. It's going so well. So I was talking about the, the fact that um, we have created ASIAS, uh, this organization, uh, and I explained already uh, which is the goal of the organization and what we are uh, doing. And our approach is actually action uh, research. We write papers, we write books, we do films uh, to try actually to give um, visibility and a voice to all these uh, women philanthropists uh, in the region. Um, so something, some information that I want to share with you about uh, the context of institutional uh, philanthropy in Latin America. Uh, as uh, Katie mentioned before, historic, historically, uh, women uh, were the ones who play a key role in the development of philanthropy. The term philanthropy is very problematic in the region, is very badly seen. Uh, the, culture, uh, the culture of giving is almost non-existent uh, based on the data collected by the Foundation Center. Just to give an example, I mean, Cathy was talking about the Green Pledge, just one family from Brazil just signed. Uh, when rich people in Latin America uh, donate big amounts of money, they give it to the uh, Clinton Foundation. Um, so basically regarding um, doing business and reputation in the first world, but not to try to actually uh, do good in Latin America. Uh, corporate and private philanthropy are on the rise, but still are very, very uh, limited in their investment and also in the social investment and also in, obviously in their impact. As I said in the very beginning, we don't have Melinda's. Um, the philanthropy does not focus on burning issues, but actually uh, on issues very general like uh, uh, putting money in museums, uh, in uh, private universities and stuff like that. And there's actually no data on giving for women and girls in the region. Uh, we just have uh, uh, this um, global trend uh, done by AWID that uh, globally uh, is 1.4% the amount of money that goes uh, for women. 
Uh, actually, uh, the non-institutional giving for women is much more interesting. Uh, and that's just something that is quite different uh, what's going on in Latin America than what is happening abroad. Um, so there are many women given circles. You all know, I guess, uh, what they are. Um, Yuna Menos, that actually was uh, fully funded by NextGen. Someone was asking about what's the role of, of NextGen. Actually, they are the ones who are uh, women, uh, are the ones that are uh, leading this NextGen uh, philanthropy movements in the region, like Nuna Menos, La Marea Verde, what just happened in Chile, in Guatemala, in Peru, in which uh, young women were on the streets uh, demanding um, for change, for social change, not for opportunities, not for uh, women's empowerment, but for social change. Uh, so this is a little bit uh, of what's uh, the context in the, in the region. And actually what we wanted to try to, to understand is how uh, with uh, this uh, work that I'm gonna present now is how uh, women's philanthropy look like. And um, based on your um, first um, uh, poll that you did, actually in this region, uh, women's philanthropy looks like uh, more like a feminist philanthropy, right? The one that took that got just 18% in the poll that you have done in the very beginning. So in order to get to know, understand how women's philanthropy look like in the region, we came up with a uh, award that was called Generosas uh, in, two, uh, in 2019. And uh, after that, uh, with the information we got in, uh, through the award, we put together this book. Uh, some comments about the, the, the award. I mean, we did the award to try to see how to get into uh, closer to women all around the region that actually we don't know, but they are doing uh, philanthropy within their own communities. We defined four categories that uh, so initiative uh, to propel access to technology for women uh, that deal with domestic violence, with sexual and reproductive health, and with issues about environment that, well, is extremely relevant all around the world, of course, but especially in the region um, in which actually, as you might know, we just sell, right, uh, envir uh, er er our environment resources. 87 women from 17 countries uh, were nominated for the award. Andres and myself, we did uh, 35 interviews uh, for, uh, the, with uh, 35 women. And we come together with an evaluation committee composed by uh, women with a lot of um, legitimacy within the region on, uh, on women issues and women philanthropy. These are the three winners, uh, Lucinda from Bolivia, uh, Rosa uh, from Chile and Sonia from Ecuador. Here are a little bit of the description that I'm not gonna read, but then you can do it if you want. And this is the book that uh, we put together uh, based on uh, 24 stories, including the three winners um, of, uh, of the award. Here on the, on the bottom, you can see where you can buy because it's available in Amazon. Well, so these are the main findings. Uh, women's grassroots philanthropy has been an historical tool for survival, resistance, and community development in Latin America. However, it's completely invisible before someone was asking about what is happening with main philanthropy in me, me, uh, uh, even in the region, uh, main, uh, the main uh, foundation are not, these women are not visible whatsoever, despite the uh, enormous uh, uh, impact that they have uh, to improve uh, the quality of life of, we, of women in their own communities. Uh, these women are um, women who ha have been uh, fighting collect collectively, what I mean by that is that they work together with others. Uh, they get no support from donors or institutional donors or government. Actually, uh, the main asset is that they, um, they mobilize uh, resources, right, in their own uh, communities. Uh, most of them uh, uh, formalized uh, their organization and some of them didn't. And most of these organizations, the ones that are in the book, have uh, uh, approximately uh, eight years old of uh, existence. For them, philanthropy is not about empowerment, meaning about increasing opportunities for women, but about challenging power, about challenging uh, patriarchy and system of oppression. 
The strength and power lies not just in the fans that quite important the fans that they are able to raise, but in the various resources that can mobilize to achieve this. Uh, uh, these uh, women are philanthropists, even though in the very beginning of the conversation of the interviews, we were asking them if they felt philanthropists themselves. In the very beginning, they said no. At the very end, they said, of course. So that was very interesting for us. They are all tackling burning issues, meaning gender violence, uh, biocultural heritage of indigenous people, digital lit literacy, ra racism, etc. So uh, the stories of La Rebelión de lo Cotidiano, that's the name of our book, are telling us that when philanthropy and generosity are deployed at the grassroots level, they are addressing uh, burning issues that deal with power. So it is much more than empowerment, it is women becoming political actors. And to finish, this is a chart that we put together uh, so to try to characterize what we mean by women's grassroots philanthropy. And uh, I'm gonna write, uh, read them very fast. So the drivers are, are survival and resistance. These uh, are people-led and community-based. Uh, they are focused on social justice. They are gender conscious. They are horizontal and democratic. They are articulated with other sectors, example, social movements. They are uh, focused on improving quality of life uh, multiple supports, address causes of the problems and not the symptoms. They are very flexible. Uh, they create and deal and manage everything in the uh, collective uh, manner. They are mostly informal, involve strongly next gen, and they are active uh, citizen participation. So I am going to finish here uh, and I'm very open uh, for questions. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Florencia. We uh, we are happy to, uh, to to open the floor for 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 more questions now, based on both uh, your presentation uh, of this, uh, you know, uh, very uh, interesting and 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 hidden world of uh, philanthropy in Latin America. I think we can also take um, questions for Kathleen as well. Uh, to to uh, you know, so questions are welcome to both uh, our speakers now. Um, so same uh, same idea. If you want to, um, uh, so I, I know that my colleague Gaetan is putting uh, also resources on the chat, so you can have uh, you know links to uh, the initiatives that uh, Florencia just presented. Um, but now I think uh, it's time for uh, another round of, of question and discussion. So again, please um, please raise your hand so that I can see you to to give you the floor. Uh, I see already a question from uh, Carola. So Carola, please uh, go ahead. Just in case there is no other. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I was uh, wondering, uh, thank you Florencia for your wonderful presentation. I was wondering uh, what is your uh, um, opinion about uh, these feminist philanthropies that you were describing in terms of sustainability? Are they um, investing in the organizations and movement themselves? Uh, um, will this uh, kind uh, of uh, mobilization be sustainable in uh, for a, a, a time horizon sufficient to uh, foster uh, social change? Um, I, I thank you very much for the question and I think it's uh, quite interesting. I think, uh, I mean, my first reaction to your question is that it's yes, because actually, as I said before, the main um, goal that they have is uh, to mobilize local resources, uh, to mobilize local resources. Therefore, uh, it's like a, a virtuous circle in the sense that uh, people who are uh, beneficiaries of their own initiatives are the ones who are supporting the initiatives. Therefore, I mean, uh, the, 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 the resources they get is the resources from their own community. Yeah, but are resources for activities or resources that can be used in order to strengthen the organization and the movement? 
actually, uh, it's very interesting. The, the resources are basically for initiatives, I mean, for activities in the field. And, uh, and the fact that they, they cannot strengthen the organization. And uh, I'm gonna say something. So uh, after we did this uh, book and this research, uh, Andresa and myself, we put together an online course for all these women, just actually to strengthen your organization. So to, to give them tools and thinking about how to improve um, the way in which they man manage their organization. So, um, uh, so that's my, my answer. Okay, thank you, Carola, for your question. Uh, I see a question from Carol. Uh, and I also see that Barbara raises her hand. So maybe Carol first and then Barbara. Carol, you need to, to uh, we can't hear you. You need to put your mic on. Uh, yes, I think it's good. Perfect, okay. yeah. Good. First, I want to thank you, Catherine McCarthy and Florencia Rostein for their conferences. It was amazing and very, very interesting. And thank you also at all the team at ESSEC for organizing you know, this kind of conference. Uh, my question is about uh, Latin America. When you are talking about Latin America, are you um, talking about all the countries of Latin America or is, are there any difference between the different countries, you know, for instance, between Chile or, or you know, between uh, Mexi Mexico, or, is there any difference or is for, uh, you know, or are you focusing on Argentina or you, you, I, I wanted to know if you have studied uh, the differences between the different countries of Latin America. Talking about philanthropy, of course. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for, for, for your question. That I, I actually think that is quite interesting. Latin America, as you might know, is very diverse. Yeah. Uh, the women uh, who, therefore, there are a lot of differences. Uh, the women who participated in this, uh, in this work, they were from 17 different countries uh, in the region. They are, in, they are a little bit, uh, well, they are from different countries. Therefore, we are talking about what is happening uh, all uh, uh, across uh, Latin America. But the interesting thing I, I believe is that even though there are a lot of differences because you have uh, different indigenous people, there are uh, countries in which like Ecuador or Brazil where there are a huge population of people, Argentina there aren't, for example, no? so there are a huge uh, differences and huge uh, cultural differences. What we will try to put together in this work is the commonalities, is the things that they have in common. And that is what we, uh, what I just presented. The things that they, even though in these uh, differences, they have quite a lot of things in common. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, Barbara wanted to add something, maybe. Um, thank you, and thank you, Kathy and Florencia. Um, as I was listening to both discussions, I was thinking about the fact that giving circles, which Florence's AS um, has been working on getting ideas about and which Kathy referred to at a different level when she was talking about giving pledge and, and other kinds of, the, um, of the, the networks that women have engaged in. And when I was thinking about giving circles being particularly popular among women, I was also thinking about some of the comments about differences in the way maybe women uh, do or think about philanthropy. And I'm, my question is whether either or both of you think that it's more the collective social nature of giving circles that sort of uh, links that with a way that women at various levels choose to give or whether it has more to do with the fact that pooled funds are necessary when you have um, less uh, sort of available accessible resources or whether, so just your thoughts about that connection with uh, giving circles and women. Thank you, Barbara. I don't know if Kathleen or Florencia wants to take the floor for that. Uh, Kathleen, I think we need to put your mic on again. Sorry about that. There, yes, is it perfect. on? It's, it works now. Uh, women in this country have historically done, may uh, have the greatest impact through the power of numbers rather than working individually. And 
even in, you know, if you look at some, some of Melinda Gates's writing, the emphasis is on community. It is in women's women moving millions. It is in women's giving circles in this country and in other countries uh, in sub-Saharan Africa with merry-go-rounds and other traditional forms of giving. And also, unlike the kinds of organizations that men have been involved in funding, they're less likely to be vertical organizations. They're more horizontal. They're more democratic. They're, they're um, not as um, aligned with hierarchy. And you can see this very much not only in grassroots giving circles in this country, but also in the way that some of the women's giving communities like Women Moving Millions have structured themselves. It's always been as a community of equals rather than a hierarchy. And once again, you can see, I mean, Melinda Gates is trying to redefine the nature of expertise from certified male experts, which have run many of the organizations run, uh, funded by men, to women at the grassroots. You know, she makes the point that you really have to talk to women at the village level to understand what the needs are and how they fit together. So it's once again, a far less hierarchical and more horizontal way of looking at not only philanthropy, but also how you find the solutions that the world today needs. So um, it's very built in to women's philanthropy. Um, and until very recently, it's been very hard for individual women to achieve anything on you know, this kind of scale, there were a few exceptions like SAGE, but they're, they changed the constitution through the power of numbers and not through the power of the purse. Thank um, you, Kathleen. Yeah, Florencia. I, I would, yeah, um, hi, Barbara, as well. Uh, thank you for the question. I mean, as uh, Barbara mentioned, I run myself some giving circles uh, only in Argentina, so to try the methodology, actually, to try to see uh, if the, this um, tool might work uh, also in, in Argentina. And the results were outstanding. Uh, the interesting thing I want to share with you is not only the results, um, I mean, in, in terms of uh, the dynamic and the, and the creation of uh, their own initiative um, that these women uh, have done, but also about the fact that all these women have a previous experience in giving, but all those uh, experiences were a very frustrating experience for themselves because they weren't involved, they didn't know what happened with their money. Um, so uh, they couldn't actually uh, be part, right, of anything, just giving the money. So what we are seeing in, in, in my region, in this region, is that People tend to, uh, to, to get involved in non-institutional and not formalized uh, type of giving because it's a way in which they are part, in which uh, it, a way of engagement and it's a way in which uh, as a, they are part of the ones who are uh, building up the initiative. Uh, and that is something that is very, very clear with the next gen in the region. They are not building organizations. They are not building institutions. They are not getting into institutions. They, they create hybrid organizations and they last. Why? As I said before, because they are the ones who are actually investing and mobilizing resources. So to make sure that this uh, hybrid uh, kind of getting together uh, stays in the long run. And I also want to say that we put together, I mean, the, 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 the success of the, of the giving uh, circles we, we ran were, was so huge. Uh, it was really interesting because most of the women then called me and say, Florencia, do you mind helping me to do another one? And I said, no, no, that was for research purpose. I don't want to become a leader of women giving circles. So we put together a handbook uh, that is extremely used in the region. Is, is in Spanish, of course, and it's extremely used by people who are just downloaded, so to create their own way of giving. So this is a little bit what is happening in the region. Uh, yes, so there's another question by Vanessa, uh, asking what about women directing philanthropic organizations? It seems there is a lack of diversity at their top, 
beside the funding itself. Can any of you um, react to this? Um, I, I, can re I, I can react. In the case of Latin America, it's exactly like that. There are not women at all in the, in, in the formal uh, institutional philanthropy uh, industry sector, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there are not women on the top at all. Uh, the, the boards are mainly uh, uh, composed by men. And, but the interesting thing uh, is that women are the ones who are doing the job, right? The ones who have the power of decision and the power of running the organization in Latin America are men and the ones who are actually running the, the show, you know, doing the initiatives in the field are women. So this is something that we also are working uh, together with uh, some of the other organizations in the region to try to, um, to change that. But that's another, uh, another initiative, another program. Um, it, it's, uh, excuse me. Um, hi, I'd like to answer too, Arthur. Arthur? Yes, yes, go ahead, please, please. Um, in the United States, we've had a number of women at the top of the major foundations, including Ford and Rockefeller and the MacArthur Foundation. Um, and that was a big change from the early 1980s when there were only two women in positions of authority in the um, foundation world, one at Carnegie and one at Rockefeller, and they were secretaries who had become the secretaries of their um, organization, so they were on the boards. There, there has been for a long time the belief that if you simply change the composition of the boards of foundations, you will get more funding for women and girls. Uh, foundation staffs are predominantly female in this country. Uh, boards are not, but the, the idea that that's gonna change things misses the point because if they're not feminists, they're, they're just going to do the same thing that men are doing. So, mm -hmm. Giving for women and girls still comprises a very, very small percentage of foundation giving in the United States, despite the fact that there have been foundation presidents like Susan Beresford, who did try to change that, um, despite the fact that the foundation staffs are now predominantly female. So um, even if you have gender equity in these organizations, the result may not reflect women's values to the extent that one might hope. Thank you, Kathleen and Florencia for, for your answers to, to, to this question. Um, sorry, I wanna yeah, add Florencia. something. As, 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 sorry, as Cathy was mentioning, one thing is to have equity between one uh, women and men. And another completely uh, different thing is to have gender lens. Mm -hmm. So we have to move. <laughs> from the current situation of inequality between women and men, and at the same time, trying to uh, build institutions with gender lens. And that might help to really change what is happening in the field. So there's a clear link between what you just said, uh, Florencia, and another question that came uh, in the chat from Jérôme, asking, do women philanthropists tend to finance mainly pro-women projects? And if so, is this a good thing? What do you think? That's for Katy because here we don't have a, a women a, a philanthropist. Um, I think that <clears throat> certainly Melinda Gates is very involved, <clears throat> excuse me, in looking at how to change the situation for women, impoverished women in villages around the world. Um, but she's also looking at ways to help female entrepreneurs, to change the workplace, and to get more women into tech. Um, when Susan Beresford was running the Ford Foundation, um, the, the emphasis was very, very much on working at the grassroots, including working with women's organizations. And Ford, provided a very strong gender lens that many organizations in various parts of the world found hair raising when they were being asked to specify how many people on their boards and how many people on their staffs were women. But it helped to apply that kind of gender lens. Uh, women, women of all groups have 
historically looked at working with, with the poor. Um, whereas men like Carnegie, as I mentioned, were much more interested in institution building and actually told people it would be better to throw your money into the sea than aid paupers. So very different attitude. Um, but yes, and, and women's funds also pioneered in trying to get some of the most impoverished grantees on their boards, which was pretty rocky, but it was also the idea that it would help the wealthy women on the board get a very different perspective onto um, issues of poverty. So there have been a lot of experiments and yes, there has been a lot of attention to working with women at the grassroots and working with impoverished women, not only to help them, but also to um, solve a lot of intractable, intractable problems like the persistence of poverty, the lack of education, and, and you know, to use Rockefeller's modest term, the conquest of hunger. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I, I just wanted to mention very quickly that uh, today, actually, is uh, uh, tonight, the, there is a French uh, foundation uh, called um, Fondation Raja Daniel Markovici, who is uh, very, in, very much involved in the, in the cause of women, and they are issuing their uh, Women's Awards 2020 tonight. Uh, and the theme will be Women and Environment. So it's a little, uh, it's a little uh, surprise that uh, it happens the same date than our lunch and lunch seminar. But uh, I just wanted to mention this, and I think we can put the link on the, on the on the chat as well. Okay, we have a few more minutes uh, for 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 questions. Um, I know that my uh, colleagues uh, Anne and Anne Claire had maybe one uh, each. I don't know if you want to take the floor, maybe. Yes, I can step in. Uh, I had a question about uh, cross-cultural um, for both of you. I guess that uh, it's very different um, if we compare the different countries, or is it the same? Like, um, are there a lot of women philanthropists in some countries and less in others? Uh, if we compare, for example, uh, Latin America and the US or the US and France, and do you know why? Is there um, an explanation? Thanks. Um, well, I, I know less about the contemporary situation in France. Uh, one of our fellows just started the first Center on African Philanthropy down in uh, South Africa at Bidvarsland. And I was at their inaugural conference and they pulled together philanthropists from all over the, the African continent. And there were a lot of women there. Um, and my sense is that those women do control a considerable amount of wealth. I've also heard from another one of our fa fellows in Egypt that there's a great deal going on among women, surprisingly in Saudi Arabia. And some of it has been focused on trying to open the door to gender equity. So we don't have hard statistics on women philanthropists in various parts of the world. And this is another part of the hidden histories that uh, scholars still have to dig out. But if the figures are correct about that I, I had up in my slide about the amount of global wealth that women are coming to control, and once again, I don't know what the methodology was on gathering that statistic, then obviously women will be in a stronger position to take prominent roles as philanthropists if they want to um, in many countries, not just the United States. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, okay, uh, I'm just uh, I'm just looking at the at the chat. If we have uh, maybe one or two final questions, and Claire, you wanted to uh, ask a final one, maybe on your on your own. Yeah. Well, um, you know, my final uh, question would you know go back to the title of this seminar, which which was you know, philanthropy: a path to empowerment for for women. I'd be um, interested in hearing um, you know your thoughts on, on this on this question is philanthropy a path to empowerment and I'm wondering whether um, you know something may also be related to what are the motivations for 
uh, women to engage in philanthropy. We've been uh, hearing about the differences in practices that we see between you know, men and, and women philanthropy. Is there a difference in motivation to engage in philanthropy between men and women? And may this then you know, help us understand uh, or craft an answer to the question of, you know, is philanthropy a path to empowerment for women? Do women engage in philanthropy to you know, reclaim some of the power that they may have uh, difficulties access in, in the rest of uh, their lives? Um, let me start with that one and answer it from a variety of perspectives. For the women in the 19th century that I've written about, participating in philanthropy gave them access to the public sphere. If I talked about Married Women Property Acts, but if you were part of a nonprofit board, um, you could own property, which you couldn't do legally as a married women, woman. You could sign contracts, which you couldn't do legally. So they got a whole host of legal rights that they didn't have. Um, in addition, they got a voice in public policy making at the local level in the United States by getting public allocations for the things that they felt were important, like getting women and children out of the almshouses. Um, when you look at um, what's going on today, what, what motivates women in you know, the giving pledge, for example, very often it's been feeling the sting of discrimination in various ways themselves that motivates it. And Melinda Gates is quite clear about this in saying that, hey, you know, I was running the foundation. I'm a co-equal partner in this marriage. It's our fortunes and I'm not being heard. Um, with Sheryl Sandberg, it was watching the kinds of things that were going on in, in the various corporate uh, hierarchies that she had worked in. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's personal, it's firsthand experience, but um, in terms of what they're trying to do, at least this small group of women, the wealthiest women in the, um, in the, the giving pledge is reorganizing American society by breaking down patriarchy, by breaking down hierarchies, by reorganizing the country, not in terms of male run institutions, but in terms of women's values about what's important and what's needed. Um, so, and it's less hierarchical. So it, it's a vision at this point, it's not much more. But if you, if, if they can manage to change, if women collectively can manage to change values on this scale, then they, they've had the same effect, the same impact as the men who reorganized American society around the corporate reorganization at the beginning of the, the 19th century. And in terms of power, women are still so underrepresented in Congress and in high political office in my country, even though that's changing, that until you have uh, a collective mass, they're not going to have the same, the same influence through politics that they can through philanthropy. And that includes working to change laws. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, Francia, you want to add something to this? Yes. Uh, I think that an unclear question is, is something that for me was extremely relevant during the research. Why they are doing that? Right? How they got involved, and uh, what, what's the driver for them? And what we uh, realized in all the interviews with uh, women philanthropists um, we did, we have seen that it, it started by, by a private need of survival, right? But it's, it's very private, it's something really personal. It's not about uh, values, it's not about ideas or ideological ideas, it's about a real personal need. And then after they, they, they have the, this need, they go to the public space, meaning they talk to other women and they realize that what is happening to them is not just them, it's what is happening to the group of women. And then they get all organized and create collective action. 
So we see very clear in all the different women. It was so amazing actually to, to share that with you. For us, when we realize that, that it doesn't matter which kind of area in which they are working towards improving uh, women rights in, in the region or in their communities, but the process was exactly the same. So it's about something, um, an ex a personal experience that is, uh, uh, that end up uh, creating uh, a collective action. And I thought that that was one of the questions that uh, I was asked before, and that um, if this is sustainable, and I think that that's one of the reasons why as well it is sustainable, because it comes from a real personal need that then becomes a community need, and therefore you have to manage that, right? So, um, and, uh, well, no, as I said, uh, it, it was quite interesting for, for, for us to see how uh, this kind of uh, process gets identical in all the women we have interviewed. And you see the same sort of process in the United States at the grassroots with giving circles and mm -hmm. at, you know, at higher levels, economic levels through things like women moving millions. When that was created, women of wealth, still many of them wouldn't use what they call the M word or the P word, meaning money or power. And the idea, there was a, the idea of the bag lady syndrome that if you gave your money away, you'd never be able to get it back. So, you know, a lot of emphasis was placed on financial literacy and investing and so on. But from the grassroots level up to Gates, there's an emphasis on sharing stories and building community as the first step toward empowerment. It's not, you know, research suggests that men are interested in power and professional advancement, and this is part of what drives their philanthropy. But with women, it's building these communities. And once again, communities and sharing stories and collectively figuring out what needs to be done. And Gates makes it quite clear that um, a major part of her education as a donor has taken place in meetings with women in women's groups in villages. Um, you know, whether or not it's really possible to form a community between the world's, one of the world's richest women and women on the grassroots is another issue. But for her, it's this collective storytelling and this collective effort to have a greater voice that drives not only her philanthropy, but also the quest for social justice and equality. Thank you very much, uh, both uh, of you, Kathleen and Florencia. I think uh, we are reaching the, the limit of our, of our time now. So uh, I would like to uh, give you a big thank you uh, to both of you for, for, for this great conversation. Uh, I know that all the, the team uh, is joining me for, for that and, and hopefully most of the participants. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Um, uh, Gaetan, maybe uh, I will let you uh, give you some news about the philanthropy chair and you know what else we can uh, you know offer you uh, in terms of content in the next few weeks or days. Yes, thank you, Arthur. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you who joined us on our live tweet. It was great, and uh, I hope some other people can join us on Twitter. Maybe we have this Twitter account uh, since a few months. And um, it's, uh, we share on this Twitter account some daily quotes about uh, research on philanthropy, which is uh, nice, I think, to, to receive. And uh, we also share, of course, our news um, on Twitter. Um, I think most of you have heard about it already, but I wanted to highlight that we uh, released our first podcast this last semester, which is called Vers une philanthropie stratégique. So it's in French. Uh, I think maybe the, the French speakers among you might be interested. So it's um, a podcast about uh, strategic philanthropy, and it is an adaptation of a book written by Peter Fromkin, Anne Clairpache, and Arthur Gauthier, which was published at the beginning of the year. Um, we are also preparing another uh, podcast for the next semester. It will be much more um, like a homemade podcast uh, in a shorter uh, version, like maybe 10 minutes every time. Uh, we will be, it's the aim of this podcast is, is to give you all a better access to research in philanthropy by sharing and presenting uh, research works. 
um, in a very easy way so that like it's uh, easy to to adapt and use in in your practical um, uh, in your practices of philanthropy and um, yeah that, I think that's it and we will of course let you know when the next lunch and learn will be ready to to invite you all and um, maybe just Anka you want to say something about uh, our next year big event <laughs> Yeah, I just want to thank you all for joining, uh, share with you the fact that we will be celebrating our 10th, 10th anniversary next year. And so we are hoping to be able to celebrate this in you know, an, an exciting and, and, and live manner. Uh, we have major plans for June. Uh, so stay tuned, we'll tell you more as soon as we know more about how our life will be by then. Uh, but thank you again for joining and we will also organize another Lunch and Learn seminar, uh, probably still online in, um, in the first trimester. Uh, so we will uh, let you know when uh, that is already organized. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cathy and Florencia. It was so great to have you and thank you so much for waking up so early <laughs> to be with us today. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.